say of the failures and difficulties of the American effort to reconstruct Iraq. Um, and the book, you know, basically argues and beautifully shows how not only were American dictates not wanted, but how badly managed the assistance was. Um, basically, rather than thinking broadly and deeply, the administrators within the um, imperial city focus on minutia, including my favorites, the traffic code and anti-smoking campaigns um, <laughs> at a time when electricity and sewage were much more badly needed. Um, and the book served as an inspiration for the film The Green Zone, which we will be showing here at 7 p.m. Matt Damon plays Rajiv's role. Um, <laughs> um, not quite. It's a very loose inspiration, um, to put it mildly. <laughs> but um, the acclaimed book has won several awards, um, including the Overseas Press Club Book Award, the Rod Ridenour Prize, and Britain Samuel Johnson's Prize. It was also a finalist for the National Book Award, and named one of the best 10 books of 2007 by the New York Times. And in addition to his award-winning writing, Rajiv has been a frequent guest on CNN, MSNBC, and NPR. And near and dear to my own heart, he's a political science major, um, albeit from Stanford University. <laughs> so today, please join me in welcoming Rajiv Chandrasekharan to the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. And we look forward to his lecture on The Longest War, a frontline view of the US mission in Afghanistan. Welcome. Thank you, Anna, for that kind introduction and to the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies for hosting this event here today. Um, for those of you who may be going to see the movie tonight, just remember it's very, very loosely inspired by the book. And if there is any uh, admission fee, uh, if, if, if uh, yes, if, if you read the book and then you were looking for the book in the movie, it's a, it's a, it's a slightly different product, but, but one, one that I, I think should hold your attention. Anyway, back in 2009, as the afternoon sun slipped behind the Lincoln Memorial on the Sunday after Thanksgiving, President Obama summoned his national security team to the Oval Office. Defense Secretary Bob Gates and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Vice President Biden were all there. So too was Admiral Mullen, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and General Petraeus, then the Central Command Chief. After three months of almost weekly meetings in the White House Situation Room to discuss Stan McChrystal's request for more forces in Afghanistan, the president had made up his mind. He'd be signing orders, he told those in his office, to deploy 30,000 more troops to the war-ravaged country. His decision meant that he was embracing the military's argument that a surge of forces, which would allow commanders to mount a counterinsurgency mission along the lines of what they did in Iraq, was the best way perhaps the only way to achieve a good enough outcome in a war that by then had entered its eighth year. But Obama had a surprise for everyone in his office. His surge, he said, would have a deadline. U.S. troops would begin coming home from Afghanistan this July, a mere 19 months away. With the decision to flow and ebb, Afghanistan had become Obama's war. There are now more troops there under his signature than his predecessors. But the American endgame will also commence under his watch. In the White House debate over McChrystal's troop request, Obama posed probing questions and encouraged impassioned discourse among participants around the table in the Situation Room. But for, as where, but for where he stood personally on the matter, nobody, not even those in the room, knew for sure. He kept his inclinations and his reservations bottled up until the night he announced his decision in part because he was not certain at the outset which course of action was the least worst option. Every path, it seemed to him, was lined with peril and short on promise. But Obama also wanted the aura of impartiality. If he chose to reject the troop increase, he didn't want any of his attendees to think or even dare suggest in public that he had approached the issue with anything other than an open mind. It fell to Vice President Biden to play the foil to assume the role of skeptic in chief. During those initial two hour sessions that included a coterie of commanders, top diplomats, and Obama's political advisors, Biden kept questioning the rationale for additional forces, unmoved by the insistence of the generals that dispatching tens of thousands more young Americans to expand counterinsurgency operations would turn around the failing Afghan war. How do we know that counterinsurgency strategy works in Afghanistan? Why don't we first try to develop a proof of concept those were the sorts of questions that Biden and his top national security advisor kept adding to the discussion. There was no secret deal between Biden and Obama. The vice president had long been dubious about sending more forces to Afghanistan, and Obama simply let him carry on with his assertions and his questions. If anything, 
It forced the generals to justify their claims, to proffer more data, to examine alternate points of view. Military commanders argued to Obama that the only way to stabilize Afghanistan was by duplicating what they believe turned around Iraq, a comprehensive counterinsurgency campaign. COIN, as the military calls it, concentrates not on hunting down guerrillas, but on protecting the civilian population from insurgents. The idea is that by separating the good from the bad and focusing on the good, it'll deprive the insurgency of the popular support it requires to expand. Popularized by Petraeus during the military's bleakest days in Baghdad, COIN theory draws upon what worked and what didn't in efforts to suppress guerrilla movements from Malaya to Algeria. But COIN requires resources and time. Protecting civilians involves ensuring law and order, providing basic services, setting up government operations, training local security forces, rebuilding schools and health clinics and other infrastructure. It also requires far more personnel than simply those required for hunt and kill missions. And even if you do all of that, change doesn't occur immediately. It can take years before the population feels safe enough, feels confident enough to demonstrate their allegiance to their nation. And there's also much that can go wrong. Atop the list of pitfalls in Afghanistan is President Hamid Karzai's government, which is often more rapacious and corrupt than the Taliban. How can COIN work when the locals are turning to the insurgents to protect them from their supposed protectors? But Obama's generals downplayed those risks and costs. In the years since the Baghdad surge, America's soldiers and expeditionary diplomats have embraced COIN with the fervor of the converted. It has become their defining ideology, just as free market economics and Jeffersonian democracy were to the neoconservatives who led us into Iraq. But in Baghdad, Petraeus was able to use coin tactics to reduce violence because both the Sunnis and the Shiites, after three years of bloody sectarian war, came to see the other as an existential threat, and both turned to the United States for security. Protecting the population meant playing referee, and he could use checkpoints and concrete blast walls to separate the warring parties. But in most of southern and eastern Afghanistan, the population has yet to seek protection. They regard the Taliban as miscreant brothers and cousins, fellow Pashtuns with whom they can negotiate and perhaps one day reconcile. <clears throat> and they worry about siding with their government because they fear Taliban retribution, both now and when U.S. troop reductions begin this summer. But as U.S. counterinsurgency strategy depends on persuading Pashtuns to get off the fence and cast their lot with their government so the Americans protect, can protect the good Pashtuns from the bad ones. And to make that happen, U.S. troops and civilian reconstruction specialists are trying to help the Afghan government win over the public by delivering services to the population that the Taliban doesn't offer. Things like education and health care and agricultural assistance and justice based on the rule of law. The problem is that the Afghan government has been woefully inept at doing that. You know, Obama never uttered the words win or victory when he announced his troop surge at West Point. Instead, he reiterated his modest goal of preventing al-Qaeda from reestablishing safe havens inside Afghanistan. In a video conference with General McChrystal before the speech, Obama emphasized that he wanted COIN to be implemented only in some parts of the country. In others, he decided, the United States would have to revert to more traditional counter-terrorist operations. He also told McChrystal that efforts to train the Afghan police and army, a pillar of COIN strategy, would not be as ambitious as the military had sought. And to ensure that he would not be dragged into an open-ended commitment, he set the drawdown date. For the first time in history, Obama made it known, America will be waging war on a deadline. Despite the White House's insistence that the U.S. strategy is limited COIN, the president's generals are acting as if they did not hear any modifiers. They're pushing ahead with a far more comprehensive coin strategy than the president appears to have ordered, hoping they can generate enough progress by this spring to convince Obama to postpone or attenuate the drawdown that's set to begin this July. And that brings us to the essential question of the moment. Actually, it's the essential question of the war as we know it now. Is the coin strategy succeeding? And more, and more specifically, is it working in southern Afghanistan? There's a lot of heated rhetoric out there on both sides of this issue, much of it generated by people who rarely, if ever, spend time in Afghanistan. I wish I could provide you with a definitive answer this afternoon, but the truth is that it, the truth is it's too soon to tell. There are indications to suggest that it might, and there are many signs that suggest it won't.
I'll discuss some of them this afternoon based on my on-the-ground reporting in southern Afghanistan, on my observations, my travels, and my conversations with Afghans, American officers, and diplomats and other members of the multinational coalition. As we chew over the question of whether the coin strategy is working, let me begin with a little dose of optimism. When General Petraeus made his case to Obama back in December that the strategy in Afghanistan is succeeding, he cited the evolution of a place called Nawa, a community of mud-walled homes and wheat fields along the Helmand River in southwestern Afghanistan. Before a battalion of U.S. Marines swooped into Nawa in July 2009 to mount counterinsurgency operations, almost every stall in the bazaar had been padlocked, as at the school and the health clinic. Thousands of residents had fled, Government officials and municipal services were non-existent. Taliban fighters swaggered about with impunity, setting up checkpoints and seeding the roads with bombs. Now, after 17 months of coin medicine, the formula has included lots of foot patrolling by the Marines, tens of millions of dollars in reconstruction assistance, and intensive efforts to build a local government. Now, after that medicine, Nawa is one of the safest districts in southern Afghanistan. Marines who live at a base in the district center have not fired a single bullet while on foot patrol in the past six months. School classrooms are packed. The bazaar is once again thriving. Petraeus is so excited about Nawa that he created a PowerPoint slide for the December White House War Strategy Review titled, Nawa, Proof of Coin Concept. The ratio of troops there, both American and Afghan, to the population is higher than it is in most places. The combined strength of U.S. and Afghan security forces in the district is now about 1,500, 1 to 1,500, or <clears throat> Pardon me, it, the total is about 1,500 for a population of 75,000. That's exactly the 1 to 50 ratio prescribed by the U.S. military counterinsurgency doctrine. On the civilian side, Nawa is blessed with a far more harmonious relationship among its tribes than most other districts, and the district governor is regarded by U.S. officials as unusually competent, and the U.S. Agency for International Development has poured in more money per capita for reconstruction and short-term employment than in any other part of the country. But perhaps the most significant reason why Nawa turned around so quickly was that the Taliban didn't put up much of a fight there. When the Marines arrived back in 2009, most of the insurgents who had lorded over the district simply fled to the neighboring district of Marja or dropped their weapons and blended back into the community. There were very, very few who decided to challenge the Marines, and those who did usually wound up dead. The Marines also got lucky with the Afghan army. The battalion sent to Nawa had been part of a national drug eradication force. They didn't have extensive military training, but the soldiers had worked together for more than a year, yielding a degree of cohesion that few other units sent to southern Afghanistan have. After months of joint operations, the Afghans have now been deemed capable enough to take charge of five small patrol bases in the district, the first step in what American officials say will be a gradual process of transition to full Afghan control over the district. The next phase, which could occur as early as March or April, will involve moving most of the Marines out of Nawa proper and into bases in the surrounding desert, where they'd be available on an emergency backup basis for the Afghans. Another reason why Nawa is so stable is governance. Unlike most other government buildings in Afghanistan, there's no portrait of President Karzai on the walls of the district governor's office. As one local leader told me, people here don't like President Karzai. His government is filled with snakes and spiders. But that attitude may be one reason why things are working so well in Nawa. Back in 2002, in the heady days after we thought we had toppled the Taliban government, then recently appointed President Karzai, appointed a five foot tall, no kidding, five foot tall warlord by the name of Sher Mahmoud Akhundzada as the governor of all of Helmand province, which is Afghanistan's largest uh, province by surface area. Akhundzada, who hails from a family of wealthy landowners that's long ruled the province, had risen to prominence as a commander of the uh, Mujahideen opposition to the Soviet occupation back in the 80s. But his rule largely involved consolidating control over opium production networks and was so brutal and corrupt, his, his sidekick police chief ran the force as a personal militia, that many residents, so disgusted by the way he was running the place, literally invited the Taliban to return to the province. And by 2004, much of Helmand was back under insurgent control. 
In 2005, the British government insisted that Karzai remove this five-foot-tall guy, Akunzada, as a condition of deploying NATO forces to Helmand. The president initially objected. Then, conveniently, nine tons of opium were found in Akunzada's basement. He was sacked, but he still to this day remains a very close advisor to President Karzai, living in Kabul. On his way out, according to U.S. intelligence analysts, he told many of his militiamen to join forces with the Taliban to protect his drug interests and help drive out the British. After two incompetent replacements, Karzai eventually gave the job of governor to a guy named Gulab Mangal, who had uh, run a couple of other provinces with some distinction. And with the help of the British and later the Marines, Mongol set out to improve Helmand's government by appointing some more competent local leaders. The guy who runs Nawa actually has a physics degree from Kabul University. And Mongol is focused on trying to deliver some basic services to the population. It's helped him build popular support. But even more significantly, he's regarded by many Helmand residents as the first leader who's been willing to stand up to President Karzai. In Nawa, there may be no Karzai photo on the wall, but there's a giant poster of Governor Mongol in the hallway leading to the district governor's office. For the Marines and for international civilian reconstruction advisors, perhaps the biggest worry about the government in Nawa is the district governor's health. District Governor Manaf was hospitalized earlier this year because of high blood pressure and other issues. But he's doing precious little to remedy his condition. He still consumes two meals a day of fried chicken enrobed in an inch-thick layer of oil. He's refused Marine entreaties to go exercise on a new track uh, built around the helicopter pad on the base next to his office. And he frequently mixes the medicines he receives from a Navy corpsman with pills his uh, messenger boy buys at the local bazaar. As one of the uh, civilian reconstruction advisors in Nawa told me, we're one heart attack away from a really big problem here. <laughs> Good government and stable tribal relations are only part of the story of why Nawa is so quiet. Another important part of the puzzle is a multi-million dollar U.S. funded economic stimulus, which, unlike in the United States, has won over much of the population. In the past year, the U.S. Agency for International Development has spent more than $30 million in Nawa. The money's been used to hire but thousands of men for short-term manual labor projects provide farmers with seeds and fertilizer to give them tractors and transform dirt roads into smooth gravel ones so farmers can take their goods to market. The financial assistance has had a direct impact on security because seemingly everyone who, who wants a job has one. Many young men have simply opted to stop working for the Taliban for the time being. The cash infusion has led to increased economic activity and many residents now have enough disposable income to buy motorcycles and cell phones. As the district administrator put it, Nawa has returned from the dead. Okay, now for my dose of pessimism. And I want to start with Nawa again briefly and then move on. It's undeniable that Nawa has undergone a remarkable transformation since the Marines swept in. And it represents what's possible in Afghanistan when everything comes together correctly and breaks right. But after making five visits to that district since the Marines arrived back in 2009, it's also clear to me that the changes there are fragile and that much of what's transpired there is unique rather than universal. If only there were more Nawas out there. Although Petraeus and his lieutenants are trying their hardest to replicate Nawas' success, it remains the exception, not the rule. Looking more broadly at the country, there's ample evidence to suggest coin strategy is struggling. Let me note a few. First, let's look at governance. The U.S. counterinsurgency strategy depends on persuading those Pashtuns to get off the fence and cast their lot with their government. The U.S. military and the State Department is trying to help the government win over the public by delivering services to the population the Taliban doesn't offer. Education, health care, farming assistance, justice, etc. But that requires capable civil servants willing to work in an unstable environment. And that's where the strategy is hitting its most significant roadblock. A recent effort by Karzai's local governance directorate to fill 300 civil service jobs in Kandahar and the surrounding district turned up just four qualified applicants. That's right, just four even after the agency dropped its application standards to remove the need for a high school diploma. The main impediment is security. Afghans don't want to work for their government or U.S. development contractors in such an unsafe environment. But if the government and its contractors can't employ qualified workers, the government can't deliver services, and it's going to be unable to win over the population's allegiance, a prerequisite for improved security. It's a chicken and the egg problem. To crack that loop, U.S. Ex officials are exploring ways to protect Afghans who are working for the government. One plan under consideration would involve literally creating a mini green zone 
in the center of Kandahar to transform a hotel and the surrounding areas into a dormitory for civil service workers. And uh, other contractors are looking at building compounds with secret entrances so that insurgents can't spot staff members coming and going from work. But just getting government officials in place is no guarantee of success. Kandahar's governor and mayor are regarded as ineffective administrators. And although U.S. and Canadian advisors are trying to transform them into more competent leaders, it's been a long and slow process. In one of the districts to the west of Kandahar, the local governor and the police chief recently got into a fight. The chief hit the governor with a tea kettle, and the governor smashed a teacup on the chief's head. The confrontation culminated in a shootout between their guards. In the Argandab district, just to the north of Kandahar, the U.S. military and the State Department spent a year working very closely with and effusively praising the local district governor, a guy by the name of Haji Abdul-Jabbar. When he was killed in a car bombing in Kandahar last summer, U.S. officials were quick to blame the Taliban. But now, some of those same officials have concluded that actually there was more to the killing. They, were, they concluded that the governor was actually skimming American reconstruction funds in his district. And his killing, they think, was simply a result of anger by fellow residents over his not distributing the spoils equitably, not a Taliban assassination. As one American diplomat familiar with the situation put it, it was a mob hit. We saw him as a white knight, but we were getting played the whole time. Of course, when it comes to Kandahar, it's impossible to talk about governance without addressing Ahmed Wali Karzai, the president's half-brother. Depending on who you talk to, Ahmed Wali is either the least worst option in southern Afghanistan, a crafty and cunning power broker who's been vitally helpful to the United States and our NATO partners, or he is the reason the security situation is so bad. It's his rapaciousness, his greed, his either your with me or against me style, according to his critics, that has created so much conflict in the province and has led disgruntled tribes to simply side with the Taliban. If only he were sidelined, they say, everything would improve. My view is that both of these arguments are a bit too simplistic, but that's essentially how the debate is boiled down in the top ranks of the U.S. military and State Department. For years, Ahmed Wali was our go-to guy in Kandahar. According to the New York Times, he was and may still be on the CIA's payroll. He also has been dogged for years by various allegations of malfeasance, including involvement in drug trafficking and land seizures. In the fall of 2009, General McChrystal and intelligence officers and his political advisors conducted the first meaningful examination of Ahmed Wali's role in Kandahar province. They soon became convinced that he should go. The former top American official at the Kandahar Provincial Reconstruction Team, a guy by the name of Bill Harris, likened Ahmed Wali to Pablo Escobar and joked that he should be expelled to Paraguay. But the military's push to remove him very quickly hit a roadblock. President Karzai demanded proof of his brother's misdeeds. But U.S. intelligence agencies didn't have a smoking gun. And General McChrystal was eventually forced to back down. As a fallback, American officials have sought to lay down some red lines for Ahmed Wali. Among them is a demand that he not meddle in elections and in the appointment of, of district governors. McChrystal's former top intelligence officer also delivered a very blunt warning in person that Ahmed Wali's activities would be closely monitored by the military. U.S. officials have described this as a policy to try to work with him to mitigate his darker tendencies. After an initial attempt by Ahmed Wali to flout the rules and draft a candidate list for last year's parliamentary elections, which was met with a swift rebuke from American officials, uh, the, the consensus view among various American diplomats is that he has grudgingly begun to change. Um, the the uh, one, one top American official now calls him much less of a meddler and more of a team player. But the American approach still depends on Ahmed Wali changing his stripes, dividing the spoils more equitably, bringing the marginalized and disaffected into his Shura tent, working for the people instead of himself. American commanders think that's possible. As one of them told me as we drove to a meeting with Ahmed Wali last year, he said, he's like a thief who's already filled his 10 bags of loot. Now we can convince him to work in the interests of his people. Well, that seems like a tall order to me. Thus far, there's been very little evidence of a genuine change of heart. I can't exclude the possibility, but should our strategy rest in part on one power broker choosing to be a less malign figure? Speaking of the Karzais, the troubled relationship between President Karzai and the West, particularly the United States, continues to hinder the mission. Consider this story. Back in October, 
General Petraeus, Ambassador Carl Eikenberry, and five other top diplomats in Kabul, including the UN and NATO envoys, spent an hour urging Karzai to delay implementing a ban on private security firms. They told him that reconstruction projects worth billions of dollars would have to be shuttered if foreign advisors couldn't be protected by contract guards. Karzai, sitting at the head of a U-shaped table in his conference room, refused to budge. He insisted that Afghan police and soldiers could protect foreign reconstruction workers, and he dismissed pleas for a delay with a sweep of his arm, noting that he had first raised the issue five years ago. As he spoke, he grew more agitated, then enraged. He told him that he now has three main enemies, the Taliban, the United States, and the international community. And I quote him. Here, him saying to, the, to General Petraeus and General I and, and Ambassador Eikenberry, quote, if I had to choose sides today, I'd choose the Taliban, he said. And after a few more parting shots, he stormed out of the room. You know, the Obama administration has been trying for the better part of a year to cast aside earlier disputes and make nice with President Karzai. But it's clearly not working. Our relationship with him has become so tortured, a senior Obama administration official told me, that we've gone from one crisis every three months to one crisis a month. In addition to security contractors, both sides have quarreled in recent months over nighttime raids by U.S. Special Forces troops and corruption investigations into members of the president's inner circle. A senior U.S. diplomat compared the relationship to a bad marriage. We fight, then we make up, then we fight again. Although skeptics of the counterinsurgency strategy contend that Karzai's actions, particularly in the six months since the Obama administration has started to try to embrace him as a partner, demonstrate that Karzai simply can't be rehabilitated. Others in Washington <coughs> say, you know, express a degree of sympathy with his grievances, saying he's simply expressing frustration about years of U.S. mismanagement of the war and a failure to respond adequately to his concerns. They say Karzai's at fault for sparking a crisis, but we're sort of at fault for letting it get there. You know, he's been talking about private security firms as a problem for, for, for years now. But unlike in Iraq, where the State Department tightened the rules on private guards after a deadly 2007 shooting involving contract guards from Blackwater, we didn't do anything in Afghanistan. So he felt like he had no other option but to throw a hand grenade on the table to get our attention. But Karzai's dispute with, disputes with the United States appear to indicate a more fundamental difference over America's war strategy in his nation. He doesn't appear to have bought into the U.S. view of what's causing the insurgency. He insists the principal problem is the infiltration of militants from Pakistan, not inept local leadership or corruption. In his view, U.S. forces should be focused on the border with Pakistan, not on operations in Afghan villages, which he regards as too intrusive and disruptive of what he believes is a system of self-regulating Pashtun governance. I'm quoting Karzai here. We'll fight with you against terrorism, but terrorism is not invading Afghan homes. U.S. troops, he said, should focus instead on necessary activities along the border. Through all of his flare-ups, Karzai is sending us a message, and that message is, I don't believe in counterinsurgency. Governance just isn't an Afghan problem. Obama's troop surge was supposed to be accompanied by a civilian surge of American diplomats, reconstruction specialists, and experts from other parts of the U.S. government, like the Department of Agriculture. Sure, there's been an increase of about 1,000 American civilians in Afghanistan over the past year, but the problem is, is that the vast majority of them are in Kabul, working in the Waldorf Embassy compound. It's Afghanistan's green zone. They got a pool and a bar and a commissary where they recently limited alcohol purchases to two bottles a night. Don't get me wrong, it's not Club Med, most, but most of these people should be in the field, interacting with Afghans, not in the capital, writing cables or sitting in endless meetings. The cash surge <coughs> is, and, and, and this, um, in this surge of money that they're in, in involved with and, and pushing out to people is, uh, is sparking a whole load of new tensions and rivalries within Afghan communities, and it's raising public expectations for handouts that the Afghan government won't be able to sustain. But getting people and money into the field is no guarantee that the right things will get done. Consider now again. It was among the first districts to receive a massive increase in American Reconstruction assistance. But in this case, it may have been too much of a good thing. Remember how I mentioned that USAID spent more than $30 million in the district? Well, that was all over one year. Given that NAWA has about 75,000 people, that works out to be about $400 for every man, woman, and child in that district. 
The country's per capita income, by comparison, is about 300 bucks a year. But that spending is a preview of what the Obama administration wants to accomplish on a much larger scale. USAID's burn rate, call it the amount of money they spend, is now about $300 million a month in Afghanistan. It's going to stay at that level for the rest of this year. The White House recently asked Congress for another $4.4 billion for reconstruction programs. Although some of that money will be directed through the Afghan government, much of it's going to go to large U.S.-based development firms. Among the programs that they want to implement is a $140 million effort to help settle property disputes. That's a good thing, but one of the agency's hoped for achievements is to train Afghans to appraise and value land in the Western style. Some development specialists question whether Afghanistan can absorb this money or whether much of it will be lost simply to corruption, inefficiency, and dubious ventures funded to meet Washington-imposed deadlines. As one USAID contractor who worked in Afghanistan for three years told me, we've turned a fire hose on these guys and they can't absorb it. We're setting ourselves up for a huge amount of waste, corruption, and fraud. And speaking of waste and fraud, corruption remains a deal breaker for the coin strategy. Despite all of the talk in Washington, Kabul, and other world capitals about the need to crack down on graft, real change has been elusive. The problem is structural and schizophrenic. The structural problem is this. The Afghan constitution effectively allows the president to select provincial and district governors, as well as local police chiefs. It's an enormous degree of power vested in the executive. That's created what I'd call a pyramid of corruption, in which low-level local officials have to pay regular bribes to those guys above them who have to pay bribes to people above them. And these bribes at the local level range anywhere from fifty dollars to $150,000 a year to maintain their positions. So to raise those funds, these local officials shake down the population, which helps drive the population to the Taliban. Now, much of that money filters up and makes its way to Karzai's cronies, and they simply deposit it in offshore bank accounts in places like Dubai. Now, the schizophrenic, schizophrenic problem is this, Washington's fundamental inconsistency on the issue. Two weeks before Obama announced he was sending 30,000 more troops, the United States pressured Karzai to form a new anti-corruption organization within his, within his interior ministry called the Major Crimes Task Force. In the following months, the Justice Department sent dozens of law enforcement specialists from the FBI and the DEA to help build the task force and teach Afghans how to assemble and prosecute graft cases. Although the American personnel would effectively be conducting the investigations and building cases behind the scenes, the assumption in Washington was that the task force would be seen as an Afghan initiative and it would be tolerated by Karzai. But the organization was soon regarded in Kabul as an American endeavor with an Afghan facade. When the task force arrested one of Karzai's palace aides on bribery charges last summer, Karzai erupted. He accused the arresting officers of acting as the Soviets did. He also ordered the aid released and instructed his justice ministry to impose new rules limiting international involvement in corruption investigations. But instead of standing up to Karzai, the evidence was there, stone cold. U.S. intelligence had wiretaps of this aid soliciting bribes. Instead of pressing Karzai, Washington buckled. The new U.S. policy now involves stepping back from promoting American-style law enforcement as the main means of fighting corruption and focusing instead on low-level graft that affects ordinary Afghans. Well, that's all well and fine, but the problem goes back to structure. The police are shaking people down because their bosses have to pay their bosses who have to pay their bosses. Unless you break this pyramid, you will never meaningfully attack corruption. But our new policy isn't trying to do that. I could go on for the rest of this afternoon detailing risks to the coin strategy. I won't, but let me leave you with one more. The small problem of insurgent sanctuaries in Pakistan. Although the CIA has conducted scores of missile strikes against terrorist targets in Pakistan using unmanned aerial drones, flown from Afghan soil, no less, with the tacit approval of the Pakistani military, those operations have been confined to the country's federally administered tribal areas that abut eastern Afghanistan. The Pakistani government has not been willing to allow any strikes in Balochistan, the province directly across the border from Kandahar. Many senior Taliban leaders are believed to be living in and around Balochistan's capital, Quetta. U.S. intelligence officials also say that several mid-level insurgent commanders have relocated just across the Afghan border to the town of Chaman in the wake of recent coalition military activities in and around Kandahar City. 
there's increasing talk among American military officers of the need to take more forceful action in Balochistan, including possibly unilateral airstrikes and cross-border raids. But the White House has been unwilling to take such steps because of worries that the Pakistanis would cease cooperating on intelligence matters and block NATO supply convoys, potentially dealing a worse blow to the Afghan mission. For now, American commanders have deployed a new battlefield surveillance brigade to the Kandahar-Baluchistan border that's equipped with a variety of sophisticated monitoring devices intended to help identify infiltrators and munition smugglers. But several officials say it's simply not enough. As one top American official put it, the problem isn't the Afghan warlords, it's Pakistan. They're the 800-pound gorilla. He says, as he sat in Kandahar for a year, we knew that the insurgents who attacked us were going to Pakistan to re-equip, replenish, retrain, and get orders to attack us again. I don't want to be too pessimistic here. I can't predict how this is going to end, nor can anyone else for that matter. And if history is a guide, Afghanistan will defy all predictions. Beyond all of the positive and negative signs, though, there are what I would call a series of uncertain developments. It's too soon to tell whether they will help or hurt, but they're fascinating initiatives that are worth watching. Let me run through four of them this afternoon. The first is a guy named Abdul Razik. He's an illiterate 32-year-old who commands a border police detachment and a vast personal militia in the town of Spinboldak, which sits on a strategic highway between Pakistan and Kandahar. He presides over a vast corruption network that skims customs duties, facilitates drug trafficking, and smuggles other contraband. But he's also managed to achieve a degree of security in Spinboldak that's eluded American troops elsewhere in the country. His force of 3,000 3, uniformed border policemen and several thousand irregular militiamen pursue the Taliban so relentlessly that Spinboldak has become the safest and most prosperous district in all of southern Afghanistan. Although he's only a colonel in the border police, when he walks through the Chaka Block Bazaar, he's mobbed by a crowd that deferentially addresses him as General Razik. Young boys want his photograph. Gray-bearded men offer him tea. If he wants anything in the bazaar, he gets it for free. But the question of what to do about Razik has vexed American officials for some time. Some of them have advocated for his ouster to demonstrate a hard line against corruption, while others have argued he'd be left alone because his force, which is more than five times the size of the NATO presence in Spinboldek, provides a vital security for troop supply lines. The U.S. Army's U.S. Army officer put it this way, if we didn't have him, we'd be screwed. The development, is <clears throat> the development worth watching is this. Over the past six months, Razik has expanded his operations to other parts of Kandahar province. His militia was instrumental in an Afghan-led operation to flush the Taliban out of Ma Majalat, a town south of Kandahar that served as an insurgent headquarters of south, <clears throat> pardon me, an insurgent headquarters of sorts complete with a court and a jail. Razik, with a cell phone in one hand and a satellite phone in the other hand, roared up from the southern desert with a few hundred men. They arrested a couple of dozen suspected insurgents, found scores of explosives, and American officials were, quite frankly, surprised at his effectiveness and his unorthodox tactics. At one point, get this, his men spotted a stolen Afghan police truck, so they fired a rocket-propelled grenade at it. It deflected off the truck and exploded in a tree. Suddenly. A man in white robes fell from the branches of the tree, himself blowing up when his suicide vest hit the ground, which then conveniently blew up the truck. Um, Razik has now been partnered with a U.S. Special Forces commander to help better coordinate his moves. But he's been called upon elsewhere and everywhere, particularly in the, some of the more treacherous parts of the Argandab Valley, where whole villages have been ringed with explosives that had made them impenetrable to American units. In one 72-hour operation, Razik's men captured 50 detainees, found five large bombs, and unearthed 500 pounds of explosives with only advice and air support from the Americans. That's unimaginable for the Afghan army to do by itself. But Razik's far from a white knight. He's been accused, as many warlords have over there, of extrajudicial killings, in addition to his involvement in corruption and drug smuggling. Even so, he merits our attention. He's going to be playing a bigger role in security operations in southern Afghanistan this year.
The second phenomenon worth all of us tracking is the expansion of what's called the Afghan Local Police Program. This is General Petraeus's effort to replicate the sons of Iraq in Afghanistan, although as we know, it will be much, much harder in Afghanistan because there isn't a binary Sunni versus Shiite nature to this war. The power dynamics and the drivers of conflict are different in every valley in Afghanistan. Karzai has authorized the expansion of the force up to 10,000 members, and special forces soldiers are working at a furious pace to establish local police units in key districts around the country. Think of it as neighborhood watch, but with AK-47s. Villagers are being recruited, trained, and paid to serve on an informal force that's intended to augment the police and the Afghan army in repelling insurgent attacks. Although it seems like a good idea, it's still not very clear whether this is going to work. Will young men be willing to fight for 100 bucks a month when policemen make $60 more and soldiers get double that? And what happens if they come under the sway of a local power broker? Could they turn into local militias? Will the members use their guns and uniforms to shake down residents? The third phenomenon worth tracking is the use of what I would call hard-edged tactics. The pace of special operations missions to kill or capture Taliban leaders has more than tripled over the last three months of 2010. <laughs> U.S. and NATO aircraft unleashed more bombs and missiles in the month of October, a thousand total, than in any single month since 2001. In the districts around Kandahar, soldiers from the U.S. Army's 101st Airborne Division have demolished dozens of homes that were thought to be booby-trapped, and they've used scores of high-explosive line charges, a weapon that had been used only sparingly in the past. Although counterinsurgency doctrine emphasizes the role of governance, development, and other forms of soft power in stabilization missions, Petraeus also believes in the use of intense force at times to wipe out opponents and create conditions for population-centric operations. A less recognized aspect of the troop surge he commanded in Iraq in 07 involved a very significant increase in raids and airstrikes. But some of the tougher methods, particularly those night raids, have incensed President Karzai, who says those missions undermine support among Afghans for the war. Many residents near Kandahar have lodged repeated complaints about the scope of the destruction. In one operation in October alone, U.S. aircraft dropped about two dozen 2,000-pound bombs. In another operation, U.S. soldiers fired more than a dozen line charges in one day. And a line charge, just to explain it, is, is a sort of a... Uh, an expl a rocket with a tow line filled with high explosives that will blast anything and everything as wide as a truck can travel for a hundred yards. Just homes, you name it, everything pulverized. As a, as a local farmer asked a top NATO general at a recent community meeting, why do you have to blow up so many of our fields and homes? Although military officials are publicly apologetic, they maintain privately that this tactic has a benefit beyond the elimination of insurgent bombs. One senior general, <clears throat> one senior general went so far as to make the burn the village to save the village argument with me. By making people travel to the district governor's office to submit a claim for damaged property, he said, in effect, you're connecting the government to the people. That general also insisted that night raids have had a devastating impact on Taliban leadership and that signals intercepts indicate a growing demoralization among insurgent field commanders. But it's still not clear whether the raids and the use of heavier munitions will have a material impact on the conflict. We'll have to wait until this summer's fighting season to find out. The fourth phenomenon that merits monitoring is a peace deal in Sangin District in northern Helmand Province with leaders of the Alakozai tribe. Sangin's lush pomegranate orchards and dense poppy groves have seen more combat fatalities than any other district in the country. More than 100 British troops were killed there from 2006 to 2010. The U.S. Marines have lost 29 men there since they took charge last summer, and the limbs of dozens of others have been blown off. Top commanders had all but given up hope that, that the district could be salvaged. But on New Year's Day, leaders of the Alakozai, a tribe that has been responsible for numerous attacks, struck a deal with the Afghan government to cease offensive acts and evict foreign fighters in exchange for the release of prisoners, the promise of development assistance, and the prospects of, of establishing their own local security force. If this agreement holds, and it's important to note that similar pacts have fallen apart elsewhere in the country, it has the potential to pacify a swath of seemingly unwinnable terrain and affect the war across southern Afghanistan. It opens up a key road in the direction of the Kajaki Dam, and fixing the hydropower plant at that dam could provide much-needed electricity to Kandahar. But the biggest impact could be on other tribes if they seek similar deals. 
It hasn't yet happened, but it's still, it'll, still early. If it does occur, it could provide the spark to get Taliban leaders to engage meaningfully in reconciliation talks with Karzai's government and the NATO coalition. But that's a big if. The Afghan government, the Americans, and NATO all want some form of reconciliation. There's a clear understanding among those players that a peace deal that involves some concessions and accommodations to the Taliban is the only realistic way to bring this conflict to an end, or at least to reduce it to a degree that it no longer threatens the viability of the state. But getting there has proved very elusive. I'm sure all of you have heard of the Quetta shopkeeper who hoodwinked British intelligence, MI6, into thinking he was a top Taliban leader, and then got himself flown to Kabul and granted a personal audience with President Karzai. The principal challenge is that the Taliban don't have a designated set of interlocutors, a political arm with whom everyone can talk and eventually negotiate. They don't have a Sinn Féin or a PLO. For this process to move forward, they'll probably need to set up an office in a neutral third country like Turkey, Qatar, or the United Arab Emirates. That, however, is only a later step in the process. Before that occurs, the Taliban inner shura needs to decide that suing for peace is really in their best interest. And their patrons in the Pakistani intelligence service the ISI, need to have a change of heart and come to the realization that a stable Afghanistan is in their interest, too. That, of course, involves a fundamental change of Pakistan's national security strategy, which is why reconciliation has been so hard to get off the ground. But efforts at peace will go nowhere without Pakistani support. Consider, for instance, the case of Mullah Berater, the former second-in-command of the Taliban. Afghan officials are convinced he was arrested by the Pakistanis, who knew full well where he had been living and what he had been doing for years when he expressed interest in opening a dialogue with the Afghan government. The Pakistanis made it clear that they will not allow a reconciliation process to move forward without their involvement. But do the Taliban really want to reconcile? Nobody really knows. American commanders believe the shellacking they unleashed on the insurgents this fall will lead them to more seriously consider engaging in talks. But then there are the conflicting messages that Washington sends. What happens this July? Are the Americans pulling out troops or not? What about 2014? Does NATO pack up and leave then? Or will there be a robust presence of trainers and advisors? If I were in the inner shura, living in the safety and comfort of Quetta, I'd probably be playing a waiting game too. That gets me back to the differences between the White House and the Pentagon about the strategy, the desired end state, and the number of troops required to get there. The civ mill divide that emerged during the 2009 strategy review, with the military pushing for more troops and the president's top civilian advisors pushing the other way, still hasn't been bridged. To move forward with reconciliation, the United States needs to be clear about what its intentions are. I spent a lot of time this afternoon talking about weaknesses in the coin strategy, but perhaps the biggest weakness is the disconnect between the desire for quick results on the part of the American public, many members of Congress, and the White House, and the reality that counterinsurgency takes time. We were fooled by Iraq. Coin turnarounds don't usually happen that quickly. I'm not here to advocate one way or another. There's merit to the quick drawdown argument, the view that America's national interest doesn't rest in vanquishing the Taliban, that we can, with a modest number of special forces troops and aerial drones, strike at anyone seeking to plot terrorist attacks. There's also merit in the argument that you'll never be able to bring peace to Pakistan, which is the real prize, incidentally, in all of this, without first stabilizing Afghanistan. The international community has made a lot of promises to Afghanistan. Will we let them down again? Back to Nawa for a second. With the district now relatively stable, the Marines plan to reduce their presence in populated areas this spring. You might think that that might make the district governor there a very happy man. Of course, you'll have fewer minders and more authority. But that's not what he wants. As he told me, we want to be like Japan or Germany. The Americans should keep their bases here to protect us. But is Nawa, is Afghanistan worth that commitment? And even if we Americans want to, do we have the resources to do it? In conclusion, the current strategy isn't tenable. Either we have to go long or we have to go short. We cannot do full-on coin with our eye on the exit door. In the 10th year of the war, with miserably high unemployment and out-of-control spending, it's hard to fault politicians for wanting to do less in Afghanistan. And it is certainly time for the Afghans to do more for themselves. But if that's the case, the strategy needs to be recalibrated. There's some in Washington who look at what has occurred in Kandahar over the past few months and draw the conclusion that the strategy is working. But let's not be lulled by what, 
by what may well turn out to be ephemeral progress. Insurgent attacks and U.S. casualties always drop in the fall and winter as many Taliban fighters go to sanctuaries in Pakistan, producing very hopeful trends on the military's PowerPoint slides. A friend who served as a civilian advisor to the NATO command in Kabul put it best. Winter, she said, is the season of eternal optimism in Afghanistan. Thank you.